So welcome to Waterfowl Identification, uh, brought to you by the Illinois Learn to Hunt program. And uh, I just want to thank Curtis, who's our main presenter tonight, for putting this together for us. And we're going to go over uh, everything from uh, introductory to ducks and the different types of ducks there are, and then go through each duck species and goose species you may find here in Illinois. And although we are focused on hunting, you can use this information just as a bird watcher, a naturalist, or maybe someone who goes to the city park and just wants to know what the goofy looking ducks are that aren't mallards. So uh, feel free to join along. And we're uh, this is a great presentation. I'm really excited for Curtis to go through this. Uh, it's really straightforward and goes right to the, the facts you need to know to identify each species. So it's really cool. So with that, we'll let Curtis get taken away. Go for it, Curtis. And we got to give a big thanks to Ryan Askren. Uh, most of these photos, like a good 75% of these, uh, came from Ryan Askren, which is a, a really great wildlife photographer and uh, just some beautiful pictures for us to enjoy here today. So big thanks to him for allowing us to use all these photos. All right, parts of a duck. We won't go over all of these parts, but the one thing that I do want to bring up is the wing speculum. Uh, take note where it's located on this duck, which is standing, and this is a puddle duck. Um, anybody know what duck this is? Little quiz. If you do, go ahead and answer in the uh, in the chat. But I'll I'll let you know at the end if I remember. But the wing speculum is very important. A lot of times this can be one of the best identifying marks uh, to tell which species of duck it is. But another thing it tells you automatically is you're dealing with a puddle duck. You're dealing with a duck in the genus Anus. So uh, really good to, to note that right off the bat. The other ducks don't have that wing speculum. So a good split right there. You can eliminate 50% of the ducks just by looking for that. And that's the first thing we're going to talk about because that's the first thing I try to do when I'm IDing a bird, when I see it, whether it's in the air, on the water, whatever it is, a long ways off, I'm trying to decide, is it a dabbling duck or is it a diving duck? And there's some um, pretty cool ways to, to tell that even when you're a long ways off. The best one, my favorite, is just the wing to body ratio. Okay, so I drew these orange bars on here. These are the same length. Um, both bars in both pictures are the same length. So the mallard, the wing is basically the exact same length as the entire body minus the bill and the tail. Pretty standard. Look over here at the scop and the wing length is maybe about two thirds of the body. A lot smaller. Uh, wing to body ratio. Just if you look at the diver duck on the right, it looks like a huge body, small wings. Uh, the mallard on the left, everything is pretty proportionate. The head, the body, big wings, smallish feet. Uh, the diver on the other hand, small little wings, big butterball body, really big feet that are positioned a little bit further back so it makes them look even that much more big so uh, that composition can really help you id even from a distance and because of those smaller wings diver ducks tend to beat their wings a little bit faster so a lot of people uh, think they fly faster it's not really that they fly faster uh, just they have to beat their wings faster to move the uh, create the same amount of lift because they're a little bit smaller. Now there are fast divers. Uh, Canvasback is one of the fastest flying ducks just in level flight around 70 miles per hour. So they definitely can fly fast, but a uh, larger wing to body size ratio on the dabbling ducks or the puddle ducks. So some other things to look for, they usually are going to feed just by tipping and we'll show you an example of that here in a second, but do take note that they can dive just because a duck does dive under the water, that doesn't completely eliminate all dabbling ducks, especially if a predator uh, flies over a peregrine falcon or something, they certainly can dive. We talked about the wing to body size, which is my favorite. The legs are more near the middle of the body with puddle ducks, dabbling ducks. This makes them better on land. Uh, mallards, pintails, they're pretty good in a dry cornfield they can move around pretty decent. They can also, with those great big wings, they can take off nearly straight up in the air. 
a lot of people, even in uh, sporting clays, there's a shot called the springing teal, uh, where a clay pigeon is thrown almost straight up into the into the air. So they can take off straight up into the air from the water, and they usually sit a little bit higher in the water if you see them at a distance sitting on a pond or something. Now here's what they look like tilting up. Uh, that means generally most of these puddle ducks are going to feed on things that they can reach. So that means within about 8 to 12 inches uh, from the surface of the water. So these ducks really like shallow water. They like new emergent wetlands with new food that's easy for them to reach. Now diving ducks on the other hand, like this golden eye down here, they are going to dive completely underwater to feed pretty frequently and and birds like golden eyes can stay under there for a good long time so uh, sometimes it'll seem like they're underwater more than they're on top of the water we talked about the wing to body size their wings beat a little bit faster and on some of these birds golden eyes especially they actually uh, create a whistling sound that is pretty diagnostic when they fly if you get uh, a good ear for what that sounds like when they beat their wings you'll you'll kind of always know it's a golden eye whether you see them or not uh, legs further back on the body this is great for diving not good on land so a trade-off uh, usually they got to run on the water like you can see this fella down here several steps along the water uh, to generate enough lift to take off with those little wings Luckily, those big feet are pretty good at, at running across the water, so it does pretty good. And they generally sit just a little bit lower in the water. And here's how uh, diving ducks feed. So now they are not really dependent upon the shallow water. These birds can utilize deeper water. And even though they uh, don't necessarily eat any more animal matter than, than dabbling ducks do, they eat a lot of vegetation, but now they can eat eelgrass and shoal grass and wild celery and things that may grow a little bit deeper in the water. All right, so with that, we're gonna start it with the wood duck. This is one of my favorites. This is one of our most common ducks that actually do nest in the Midwest. So a lot of us get to not only see these in the fall, but we get to see them actually all spring and maybe you get to see them uh, raise some uh, little ducklings in the in the spring as well, but really beautiful bird. So this we classify as a dabbling duck, but it's not a puddle duck. This is actually a perching duck, so a little bit different. Remember I mentioned that speculum Wood ducks do not have a true speculum, so they are not in the same genus as our other puddle ducks, um, and they like to perch in trees. They are going to raise their ducklings in, in probably a natural cavity or a man-made wood duck box. A lot of things are different about the wood duck. No speculum, but they do have iridescence all over the back. Now, iridescence is a color, basically that pigment does not exist in the feathers. That's a structural color that exists by the sun hitting the feathers. So kind of hard to explain, but uh, depending on which angle you look at it, it could be different colors. And a lot of times if the sun's not hitting it just right, wood ducks can look almost completely black. The things that I really like to look for are that tail. If you kind of notice in these pictures, they have a squarish tail and they have that nice crest. Even the females, like you see down there in the middle, she's got iridescence on her back too. Uh, look for that crest, look for that nice square tail, look for nice uh, white belly. Another good clue with wood ducks is they move their head a ton when they're flying. They're used to flying through the timber, so they've got to be very agile. They look around more than any other ducks. You'll see them moving their head all over the place when they're flying. And here, if this sound works, we'll check out what they, what they sound like. So yeah, that squeal, if you hear that, wood duck is probably on its way. All right, American Wigeon. Okay, some people will call these bald pate because look at that uh, white mark on the front of its head there. That's a really good mark. 
One of the best marks though, on at least the drakes or the male is that big white wing patch. So that's not the speculum that sits just above the speculum. The speculum is uh, just below that on the secondaries and on widget, it's gonna be green uh, depending on how the light hits it. So you can kind of see that green coming through a lot like the stripe that goes through its eye. Now it's green most of the time, but if you get the light to hit it just right, it can look anywhere from orangish to bluish, uh, and that's the stripe, and then also the, the speculum, which again are all iridescent. That pigment does not actually exist in the, in the feather itself. That's created by the structure of the feather and the light that's hitting it bouncing off of it. So really, really cool. But look for that big white wing patch on the drakes. Another great thing I like to look for on the widgeon is look how bright white his belly is. Even the hens, which we, we didn't have a good picture of, but even the hens have a nice, uh, really light colored belly with a good line of demarcation where that darker uh, breast starts. So if you see that coupled with a big white wing uh, patch, you're pretty sure you're dealing with widgeon. And another reason I like widgeon is they're pretty vocal. Here's the sound. Yeah, that's the Drake widgeon whistling. Kind of says like a, a who me who, who me who who, who me who is uh, kind of the phrase that they continuously repeat. And a lot of times you can you can hear these before you see them. Can you play that again with the who me who? All I heard was a squeak toy. Oh, okay. Well, it could sound like a squeak toy too, I guess. Oops. All right, that last that last one had it. I'm sorry, Curtis, but yeah, that last oh. one you could hear the whole the the you're almost listening for synonyms, not synonyms, uh, syllables. You're looking for syllables or like patterns to it, like that, to kind of break it apart. Yeah, and when there's multiple ones calling, it can be hard. And yeah, a lot, sometimes they'll just say like "Who me? Who me? Who?" Kind of like the barred owl, who's "Who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all?" A little bit of variation in there, but definitely listen for that whistle that kind of makes that that sound along those lines. But this is a cool duck that we don't get a ton of. You're more likely the further east in Illinois you get. But American black duck, this is a duck very similar to mallard. Sounds a lot like a mallard. Uh, same size as a mallard. It'll be associating with mallards most of the time, but much, much darker. Um, really easy to tell these apart from a hen mallard if you have both in your hand, but if you only have one, uh, what you really need to look for is look at that bill. It's yellow. Hen mallards have orange bills. So if you think you have a hen mallard and you look and it's got these uh, bright orange feet and a bright yellow bill, uh, guess what? You need to think again. That could be an American black duck or potentially a model duck too, but um, look on the black duck, look at where the wing meets the body. There is just a vast difference between the body and the under wing. This stands out big time when they're flying. I mean, uh, big time for a puddle duck. It, it looks like a lot of the black and white um, uh, diver and sea ducks that we'll talk about later. So a uh, big time giveaway. See that? Look at that yellow bill. We definitely do get them. Um, every year, just not nearly as often as some of the other ducks on the list, like of course here, our buddy the old mallard. Um, now notice how the speculum is, it's got white bars on the top and bottom. Okay, mallards, whether it's a, a drake or a hen, the wing is always going to look like that. The bright speculum, it usually looks bright, bright blue, and it's bordered with white on either side. Uh, the true black duck does not have the white border on the speculum, uh, so that's another good way to tell them apart. Generally, the black duck speculum looks more purple than blue as well, so 
uh, butt mallards. Everybody knows these. Here's the sound, of course, that we're all pretty familiar with. The basic quack of the hen mallard. A drake uh, kind of makes a nasal uh, sound kind of similar to that. Didn't have a good example to put in there, but with ducks, not only do the drakes and hens look different, but their, their syrinxes are actually different as well. So they make different noises, which is pretty cool. All right, gadwall. This is another really common duck across all of the Midwest. This is our lone puddle duck with a white speculum, really special. If you see, now a lot of ducks have white wing patches, but there's only one with a white speculum. So if you see that square little white right there in the secondaries, guess what? You're dealing with a gadwall. These are all drakes. Another good um, ID point is that butt. Look how dark black it is. You know, the gadwalls, even though most of them are nondescript, now these are all spring drakes, so they, they look gorgeous. In the fall, they're going to look a little bit more drab, but they always have that really dark black butt uh, that you can you can pick them out whether they're tipping up on the water like that or flying through the air. Um, they do have that rusty that kind of leads the white speculum once you get a, a nice drake, but less common that you see that rusty, more common that you look for that white square along with a dark butt and then an overall just gray, gray duck. Here's what they sound like, which is also really diagnostic. That's it. Just the little short little nasal quack from the, the gadwall. A lot of times you hear them before you see them as well. All right, the northern shoveler. Gotta love these ducks. These uh now their wing looks fairly similar to a blue wing teal. It's got the the light blue patch in the front, a little bit of white, green speculum but northern shoveler are about oh half again as big as a as a blue wing teal so much bigger and then obviously look at the head uh, much bigger spatulate bill this is pretty um, easy to pick out even when they're flying a story i like to tell i took a good buddy of mine i worked at an archery pro shop i took him on his first duck hunt he was um excellent shooter i think he was uh, even like an alternate for the olympics really awesome uh, shotgun shooter he told us at the beginning of the day he didn't know anything about ducks but he's a good shot don't worry about him um, anyway fast forward to the end of the day he was out of shells and he didn't have his limit but he the first duck he saw was a shoveler and he goes oh a duck's coming and it's got something in its mouth and that's what you'll think when you see a shoveler, if you're used to looking at other ducks, is it'll just look a little bit front heavy. So anytime you think you see that, you're probably dealing with a shoveler. Now when the drakes get in, in good fall, good winter um, coloration, so let me go ahead and elaborate on that. So ducks in the, basically in the summer, the drakes look pretty similar to the hens. They kind of all adopt this pretty cryptic uh, coloration so that they're, they can hide a little bit better. Now, they will molt and actually adopt what's called the, their breeding plumage, which is the very bright plumage that you're seeing on the shoveler here on the right. Uh, this happens at a different rate for all ducks. But in general, most of these ducks are really starting to get into their spring uh, plumage when our waterfowl season is starting in October, November, and uh, they probably look the, their best once we get into like uh, February, March, April, actually into their breeding season. So um, that does change throughout the year. The shoveler up in the top, he's a little bit not quite as far, far along as a couple of these other shovelers, but look at how it has that really light breast followed by a chestnut belly. So it's almost the opposite of a mallard, right? A mallard has a green head as well, 
but then it goes green to a chestnut breast and then to a whitish belly and a shoveler is kind of uh, the reverse of that. Here's what they sound like, but you really don't hear this sound much except during the, the spring. Uh, the females also do kind of a coarse quack that sounds similar to, to a lot of these other ducks quacks. Uh, Northern pintail. Again, another bird, this bird all over Illinois, one of pretty much everybody's favorites. You gotta love the pintail, they're so graceful. Look at that long neck, that sleek build, uh, just just gorgeous, gorgeous birds. And really that neck is what stands out to me when you see the drakes especially. Now even the hens, if you look at that picture in the right, that one lower bird is a hen pintail. And so she doesn't have the white neck, but still you notice a long neck. The whole the whole bird is pointy. The the scientific name is Anis acuta. So the whole thing is, is kind of pointy and sleek and elegant and just a beautiful bird. But uh, now we're talking about a little bit different colored speculum here. The speculum can be anywhere from like tannish brown uh, to slightly green depending on how you, you look at it, but definitely a little bit different. And because they have this long white neck, when they're flying around, it almost looks like their head is floating out in front of the, the bird, which, it, which might be a, a weird way to explain it. But when you see this in the wild, you'll kind of see what I'm talking about. Long neck with white and then a dark head. It almost looked like the, the head's just kind of floating out there in front of the, the whole bird. but. And then obviously the, the namesake, the pintail. Now this is something they're going to develop later in the year. So early in the year, they're not gonna have great big, uh, they call them sprigs, the, the tail retrices that grow long like that. They're not gonna have great big ones like that this time of year. They might have little bitty short stubby ones, but they still got the, the pointy tail. And here's what the great sounds like. Just a low little trilly whistle. And again, the hens have a quack that's, that's pretty similar to a lot of these birds. All right, blue winged teal. This bird has the honor of being the very first to migrate through. Uh, this bird does not like cold weather at all. As soon as the days start to get a little bit shorter, in August, these birds begin to migrate. So they, you do not generally see blue wing teal in the same area as snow and ice. Green wing teal, yes, absolutely. Blue wing teal, no. Uh, in fact, the great majority of blue wing teal have already migrated and they are far, far south of here. Um, so they are, they are through a lot of people that duck hunt normal duck seasons don't even see blue wing teal. So that's why there is a a special teal season that takes place in September uh, just to sort of cap capitalize on their uh, incredibly early migration. But this, these are spring specimens. So you see the nice white crescent moon. That's obviously super diagnostic, but in the early fall, September especially, you're not going to see that. Not at all. All the blue winged teal are going to look like these hens here, which are pretty nondescript. Um, they're much smaller than a mallard, so they're only going to be about a third to maybe a half the size of a mallard. Um, if their wing is open, you will notice, just like the shovelers, they've got a nice blue patch on their wing above their speculum, and then they've got a, a green speculum below that. But the drakes and the hens both will have that blue patch on their wing. Also, notice the bill. The bill although it's not a shoveler bill it is thicker and heavier than the green wing teal which we'll see next so just kind of notice how that bill kind of heavy thick for the head uh, and we can compare that to the the green wing teal after we hear the great blue wing keeping and the hen blue wing, as well as the green wing, they both have a quack that's a little bit more high pitched than the, the mallard quack. And I'll, I'll play it when we listen to the sound of the green wing. But 
Now look at the green wings bill. Even that hen, she's pretty nondescript. You can see her green speculum uh, peaking there, but she does not have any blue patch on her wing. Still got the a green speculum, nondescript, but look at the bill, much smaller, thinner for her head. Uh, so nice way to tell those two apart. Another thing I love to look for on the drakes is this white bar that's on their shoulder. That bar, you can, it's surprising, but you can actually see that a long ways away. Under certain light conditions, you don't see all these colors on these birds. It's not quite like looking at these beautiful pictures that Ryan Askren took. Uh, sometimes you're you're dealing with what you have and one thing that really does stand out is that white shoulder bar and guess what green wing teal is the only bird that has it so you see that you're in good shape to know know what you're looking at here's what he sounds like And here I'll also play the quacks of a female so you can kind of hear how it's a little bit more nasal, higher pitch than a mallard. So you still hear the drakes in the background, but the, the very nasally high-pitched quack and an eastern meadowlark in there for those of you keeping score at home all right now we're into the divers so we're past the puddle ducks no more speculums now diver ducks and of all the diver ducks and really of all ducks the canvas back is called the king uh, this is the duck that back in the old market hunting days they fetch the highest price very excellent table fare, a beautiful bird, and uh, one of the fastest flying birds at just normal cruising speed, flying about 70 miles per hour. Awesome birds. But one of the things we got to notice here, canvas back. Look at the back. It is just a nice off-white, almost uniformly all across the back. That is diagnostic for the canvas backs. Now, whether it's a drake or hen, another thing that's diagnostic is look at the shape of the head. It's a little bit more goose-like than duck-like, but whether it's a drake or a hen, all canvas backs have this shape to their head, this sort of sloping. There's no abrupt slope at all. It's just kind of a gentle, uh, slope all the way down from the forehead to the tip of the bill. And now you'll notice I did not add sounds to most of the, the diving ducks. You can find these, but the diver ducks are way less vocal. And in my opinion, the sounds are way less diagnostic. So I did not include them here. Okay, now I gotta stop annotating one second so I can switch it. There we go. All right, so this bird looks a lot like the canvas back, but this is a redhead. Again, the same sort of colorations where he's got uh, that really red chestnut up in the head and then dark and then light, but unlike the canvas back, which had that pure, nice off-white uniformly across the back, look at this redhead. It's much more of a bluish, uh, much more of uh, off color to the back of that. Certainly not white. You could call it gray, you could call it bluish, uh, but not white. So much different there. And the biggest thing is look at the shape of the forehead. If you follow the bill up to the forehead, there is an abrupt slope to the forehead. That, as you remember, with the drake and the hen, uh, canvas back did not exist. So redhead has that abrupt slope to the forehead. Canvas back does not. Now, another thing to mention is uh, the hen redhead looks very similar to a hen ringneck. The bills, very, very similar. Look at that with the black tip, a little bit of white, and then kind of that bluish gray. You'll see the exact same bill uh, with a ring neck, 
but look how the hen redhead kind of has that brownish reddish coloration throughout that nice little white eye ring little lighter color down there at the base of the bill uh, we'll compare that to the the ring neck that we see here in a bit which was right here and the hen is the bird to the left there look at how now the bill looks pretty similar, but now you would definitely not say this bird has like a reddish brown tinge. It's really gray and black, okay? It's still got a little bit of a, a white eye ring, but the whole thing is um, grays and blacks, no red. So uh, that's the best way to tell them apart when you get hens. Now, of course, the drakes are unmistakable. Uh, look at the ring neck, black and white. It's going to be more likely to be confused for a scop than a redhead. But look at that bill. Scop don't have bill like a uh, bill like that, where you've got the black nail, the black tip, white, and then the the grayish blue, and then a little bit of white up above that. And some people look at this bird and say, why in the heck do they call it a ring neck? It should be a ring bill or something, um, and, and maybe it should, but it actually does have a brown ring around its neck as well. It's really hard to see, but it is there. Uh, so just, I guess, trying to justify for the people who named the bird a couple hundred years ago, um, cut them some slack. Um, another thing. I, I always think that ring neck, Drake ring neck almost look like they have a Nike swoosh on them. Like if birds could be sponsored by companies, um, I suppose ring neck would be uh, friends with Michael Jordan because they'd both be sponsored by Nike. Um, cause it, it, that really white shoulder patch, and then it gets grayer as it go back, but it kind of does make that Nike swoosh um, sort of shape there. It kind of looks like Fudgy the Whale, if you've ever seen Fudgy the Whale. I think it's the East Coast thing. A greater and lesser scop. So as far as hunters are concerned, they just call them scop because you don't have to ID them uh, when you're hunting. But they do, this is the reason why there's a different limit on, on scop. A lot of times you'll see where scop will have a limit of maybe two for the first 45 days of the season. And then it drops down to one for the last 15 days. And that is an attempt to change the way they manage these two different scop because lesser scop are the ones that are here for 90% of the season, except for the very, very end where we do get some greater scop here in the Midwest. So that's the first best way to tell them apart is just time of year. Another good way, first, let's see, how is it a scop? Well, at first glance, it kind of looks like that ring neck, except look at that bill, just a very plain blue bill. In fact, you'll see a lot of the old timers just call them blue bills, blue bills, because uh, they have a very plain blue bill with a little black on the tip. Um, other than that, fairly nondescript. They do have some iridescent colors that wash over them. So you may see them green anywhere from green to purple, um, but a fairly nondescript duck. Now, the hens have this big white frontal shield, which makes it um pretty easy to pick them out from other hen diver ducks but now how do we tell lesser from greater if they're flying the best way is to look at that white in the wing so this is a diver so this is not a speculum but they do have that white stripe in their secondaries in lesser scop the white is only in the secondaries and it stops abruptly when you get to the primaries and those feathers have no white in them whatsoever. If you go up to that top picture on the right is a greater scop, look at the white. It's in the secondaries, but it continues into two thirds of the primaries as well. So you see that white continue, uh, continuation over halfway through the wing. Now, another good thing to look for with scop this next slide is going to show you the head shape now what if they're not flying you don't see their wing are you just out of luck you can't id them no now you need to go to the head shape greater scop has a much bigger thicker bill head and build the whole duck is bigger um, but look at where the highest point of the head is 
greater scop kind of have this pompadour type uh type head where the forehead up in front of the eye you know think like beluga whale it's really bulbous and that's usually the peak of the head is up in front of the high uh in front of the eye lesser scop on the other hand the peak of the head is usually behind the eye look at this guy the head is, the peak of the head is back there so um yeah really good way to tell them apart people that get a good eye for this this is all they have to see and they know for sure if it's a greater or lesser scop okay common golden eye butterball ducks now we're into the black and white ducks these are called sea ducks even though obviously in illinois we don't have a whole lot of seas we still got common golden eye guess what but uh, one of the uh, distinguishing things about sea ducks, which for here is common golden eye and, and buffle head, is they have a two-year sexual maturity. So if you look at the, the picture down there in the lower um, left, there's a drake and a hen almost assuredly. But above that, those two that look like hens, they may or may not be hens. You'd have to get in there closer. I think the one in the front is actually a first year drake because look how it has a, a decent amount more white on the wing. First year drakes look very, very similar to hens. So the one in the very back, I think, is the hen. The one in front of that that also looks like a hen is probably a first year drake, uh, which again, <clears throat> have a picture of on the right there. But really diagnostic, and if you see that really white ball that sits in front of the eye, that's the only duck that has that. If you see that white ball in front of the eye, you're talking about a common golden eye. Again, listen, I don't have a good recording of this, but uh, their wings make a whistling sound kind of similar to if you're familiar with doves when they fly. Uh, common golden eye is just a, a much louder, more piercing uh, style of that. So really cool to hear if, if you get a chance to be around some. So here's the other one, the bufflehead, another sea duck. So again, um, the, in the lower portion there, you got to tell the drakes, the first year drakes from the hens by bill size. So it looks like that one that's right in front of the drake looks like a hen because she's got a really small bill. The one in the very front has a much bigger, thicker uh, bill and head. He looks more like the drake in the back. So that's almost assuredly a first year drake. Um, but for the second year and beyond drakes, obviously that white basically triangle in the back portion of the head, very diagnostic. These little birds are about the same size as teal. They're little butter balls with those little wings. Um, so definitely make some cool whistling sounds when they fly around as well. Uh, these, these birds can be a lot of fun to watch for sure. Now, stiff tailed duck. So these are in diving ducks, but a little bit different. Look at the tail sticking straight up. Uh, well, that's the reason for being in the stiff-tailed ducks, ruddy ducks. This is not uh, the way that they look this time of year. Ruddy ducks is one of the ducks that uh, plumes up the latest out of all the ducks. So they don't look like this drake in this picture here until like summer. Uh, so one of the very, very latest to look like that. Most of the ones that we see here in Illinois are going to look like that little picture of the one taken off there. Very, very nondescript. But luckily, uh, when they sit on the water, they do stick their uh, tail up right there, making the whole duck kind of look like a U shape. So really easy to, to tell. They're not the, the best flyers. They're not, uh, I would say they're like the opposite of pintail. Pintail are elegant and all, all that, and ruddy ducks are, well, they're the opposite of that. Mergansers. Uh, these are, they're beautiful, but for duck hunters, these are generally not going to be what's maybe targeted. Mostly because these are fish eaters. Look at the bill there in the middle. They've all got the the 
uh, fish catching bills. So this is a much more fish and animal matter eating bird. Because of that, they can have issues with PCBs, heavy metals, toxins in the water. Not quite as good as our fat mallards and wood ducks that are eating corn and acorns. So beautiful birds, not quite as good table fare. Uh, all three of them are possible in Illinois. Although um, early in the year, it'll probably only be hooded mergansers that are seen, which some of them do nest in Il Illinois. Um, later in the year, it could see common mergansers and then red-breasted mergansers, probably the least common. Um, in fact, I have not seen them in Illinois. I've only seen them in Missouri back in my college days a few times and then out west, but all three are potentially possible. Now on to goose. Everybody knows the Canada goose, very diagnostic, but what you may not know is two distinct populations that have different management goals. The migratory population of Canada geese uh, is stable to maybe decreasing depending on, on the year and how their habitat is doing. And then our resident Canada geese, the giant Canada geese, these are steadily increasing, not just in Illinois, but practically across the whole country. You know, these geese take advantage of golf courses, parks. Uh, they live a pretty cush life. Pretty much it's only coyotes and maybe the occasional bobcat or, or red fox that takes them out. Uh, maybe a car smashes one or two, but other than that, they've found a little niche where they've got good food and fairly good protection from uh, both predators and hunters, and um, they're doing really well. So a lot of golf courses, homeowners associations, uh, farmers have a lot of issues with, with geese. It's usually the resident geese that are here maybe year round. Um, it's not usually the, the migratory population that's only going to come here after, after bad weather drives them here. Now we're going to play the sound, and of course we've all heard this. This is your typical two-note Canada goose sound. Well, although they can make lots of different vocalizations, the, the general vocalization is two notes. As opposed to these, white-fronted goose, speckle belly, uh, a lot of people will call them. A lot of times the call that they make has three notes. So instead of just hearing a just that two note, it's more of a three note thing that I'll play here in a second. But when you're looking at them, a couple things really uh, will let you know what this bird is. First off, the reason people call them speckle bellies. When these birds are mature, they're going to have those black speckles throughout their, their breast and, and belly and flanks. Really diagnostic. Now, immature birds a lot of times will not have any of that, but look at the face. That's all you need to see. White fronted goose. It has a white frontal shield uh, behind their pinkish bill. They also have really orange legs as opposed to Canada geese, which have dark legs. But look at that pinkish, that little orangish pinkish bill with that white frontal shield. Um, that's all you need to, to see. Their sound is also diagnostic. So let's listen to it here. See how it kind of has three distinct parts as opposed to the two parts of a Canada goose call. And normally there's a bunch calling at once, so you can hear a lot of them calling, calling together. But this is a, we don't have resident white-fronted geese, so when you do see white-fronted geese, these are migratory populations. Another goose we don't have resident population for, snow goose, uh, snow goose, and also blue goose. So same species, the lesser snow goose has different color phases. Some of them 
are going to be pure white like the the snow geese here and uh, it's a juvenile there to the right so it's mostly pure white with a few off colors in there uh, but then there's also blue geese which this is a juvenile here when they uh, blue geese become adults that head will be pure white and the rest of it will be that blue coloration same species again a different sound now for snow geese they really just have one note in their call but they do it really frequently and generally there's hundreds of geese calling at once so here's what it sounds like <laughs> So almost similar to a Canada goose without the first note, like without the brrrr, you know, they go brrrr. Snow goose is almost just that high pitched note at the end of the Canada goose. So obviously big white birds, so they generally um, pretty easy to tell with, with black wing tips when they're flying around. And these are the ones we see huge concentrations of in the spring. Uh, if you're if you make it by Imaquan, Chautauqua, that area uh, starting sometime in like February and March. Wow, the sound of snow geese can be deafening. They'll have hundreds of thousands, if not close to a million snow geese down there. And just seeing them all fly around at, at once is uh, it's an awe inspiring sight that pretty much everybody needs to go and check out at some point. And the snow goose's little cousin, the Ross's goose. Now, first, you might say, how in the world do you tell these two white birds with black wing tips apart? And it's all in that bill. Uh, the Ross's goose has a shorter, little shorter bill, the same color, same pinkish bill, but no grin patch. So that snow goose on the right um, snow geese are grubbers. They have that big grin patch uh, full of little lamellae, little serrations that help them grab a hold of vegetation and rip it off and tear stuff out of the ground. Um, and they, it gives them a grin patch that kind of always makes them look like they're snarling. Ross's goose geese don't really have that. So see them right there together, real easy to see. Most of the times they will mix. If you see a really big flock of snow geese, uh, generally there's gonna be a Ross's goose or two mixed in there. And usually they stay to the outskirts. They don't usually go to the interior. Uh, so usually you can, if you have a spotting scope, just look through the outskirts until you find one without a grin patch and there you go. All right, now we've got a few videos, a couple of videos here that we're going to play that's going to be some practice IDing ducks on the wing. So because this isn't an actual in-person workshop, uh, we can't go out and look for ducks and practice on the wing. So this is the best we got. I found some pretty good videos on YouTube and I tried to position it where we couldn't see the words. Uh, and we're going to try to ID these in real time. So hopefully this works. All right. What I'm seeing is a bird that's got a very normal looking wing to body size. So we're looking at a puddle duck here. I'm also catching a glimpse of a little square white thing back in the secondaries that looks like it might be the speculum. Overall, this bird just kind of looks drab gray, but I see on the drakes a very dark black butt. You know what we're dealing with here? Oh, it's our old buddy, the gadwall, gadwall. So hopefully some of you, some of you were able to get that playing along at home. Okay, here's another one. So now we've got a bird on the water from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So this bird's not flying. Not all the birds we, we see are going to be flying. But look at this bird here. Pretty nondescript. I definitely don't see anything that looks like a speculum. 
So I'm going to guess this is a hen diving duck. Ooh, look at that big foot way back in the body. Yep, definitely looks like a hen diving duck. I'm also seeing a really white frontal shield around what's pretty much just a bluish bill. Yep, bluish bill. Hopefully that was a good, um, a good giveaway to what it is. That's what a lot of people call bluebills, the scop, and this is a lesser scop. All right, now we will go to the next one here. This one's got some sound with it. Look at all these birds. Looks like it's early in the year because everything's green, no ice. Must be an early migrator. Big flocks of birds flying low to the water, irregular flocks. Ooh, they all have a bluish wing patch. Yep, blue wing teal. So that's the bird that flies through starting in August, and most of them are through in September. Um, the one that has its own special season because they fly through so early, blue wing teal. All right, let's take a look at this one where we've got several species of birds on the water. I'm seeing some with a head. Ooh, look at that right in the middle. That's different than the others. You'll see the ones with the red head that have a very gentle slope to their bill onto their head and a pure white canvas back. Obviously, those are canvas backs. Now, if we look at a lot of these other birds in here, I'm seeing a lot of scop. Are they lesser or greater scop? I'm not 100% sure. Kind of look like they could be greater scop, but look at the ring neck that just popped up in the middle. See that Nike swish on them? A little bit different than the scop. Hen canvas backs, hen ring neck. Pretty cool. Good little chance to see a few divers there. Now, let's check out this one. Another pretty nondescript bird, but oh, now we've got a speculum. So this is not a diver duck. This is a puddle duck. That speculum looked like it was blue to purple, and it really didn't have much white around it. Kind of looks like a hen mallard, but a little bit darker with a yellow bill. Obviously, American black duck. So hopefully some of you got that at home. Same size, really similar to a hen mallard, just a little bit darker. All right, let's check out this one here. Ooh, got some birds in the air that are just just graceful. Look at how beautiful they are flying there. Almost looks like the head's floating out in front of the bird. That nice long white neck and pointy tail. The whole bird just looks very acute. Northern Pintail. This one, everybody, one of their favorites. Just a beautiful bird. So fun to watch and just so graceful. Um, I mean, all ducks are fun to watch fly, but if you don't like to watch pintails flying, I don't know, you need to go to your doctor and get checked out because something's wrong with you. Okay, our last one, our last one. Hopefully some of you have uh, been getting all these right. So here's your last chance. Okay. Ooh, whole bunch of birds. Wow. Kind of hard to see, but wow, they kind of look like they got big heads. Look at this. They're getting a little bit closer. You got white right up on the front and then chestnut behind that. That's different. That's opposite of mallards. 
So hopefully you all remember the bird that's the opposite coloration of mallards, but looks like it's got something in its mouth. That's the northern shoveler. So with that, we got to talk about the federal duck stamp. Whether you're a duck hunter or not, if you enjoy wildlife refuges, if you enjoy going out and looking at birds, uh, the duck stamp is one of the best ways to give back to that. Buy your $25 duck stamp. You can go right to your U.S. Postal Service and get them. Uh, sometimes your the same places that sell hunting licenses will have them as well, but you can go right to your post office and get them. And 98% of all the money raised from the uh, duck stamp or the uh, the federal migratory bird and conservation stamp, 98% of those funds go directly back into the system to buy and protect wetland habitat. So this has been one of the most successful programs for this. It's led to a number of just conservation success stories. There were a number of waterfowl that were on the brink of extinction uh, between, you know, around 1900 to 1950, just imperiled. And because of the federal duck stamp, because of Pittman Robertson, because of organizations like Delta Waterfowl and Ducks Unlimited, uh, these species have seen just remarkable conservation comebacks and uh, to where today we've got awesome and robust populations. Now, there's still some species that are not doing as well as others, you know, mentioned scop, uh, pintail, canvas back. A um, few of those species are not doing as well as maybe blue winged teal or gadwall or green winged teal, mallards, birds of that uh, nature. But overall, this system has been a overwhelming success and still just the vast majority of this money goes right back into the system to give more habitat for ducks. It's a win, win, win. So I always tell everybody, I don't care if you hunt or not. If you like to look at birds, if you like to go to wildlife refuges, buy your duck stamp. It's a little piece of art you can display and you can pat yourself on the back for really uh, supporting this conservation. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, any questions we might have. Yeah, well said, Curtis. Um, so yeah, so if anyone has any questions or anything like that, we can take them right now. And uh, if not, that's great. But we will have a recording of this and we'll send that out to you all because I'm sure, uh, given the breadth of information we covered today, that uh, you don't have it all memorized quite yet. So it's be great as a resource to kind of go back over and play this over and over until you get them all hammered out. Uh, so any questions at all, we'll take those. All right, Curtis, I think you did a great job. And with no questions, hopefully some people are getting out hunting, whether it's uh, waterfowl hunting or deer hunting. Uh, I know we've got our first firearm season coming down the pipe, but rut activities, uh, it really, it's been pretty hot. So hopefully it's going to continue that way. Sounds good. All right. With that, we'll see you all in the field. Bye, everybody.